good day to you, Sammy. Indeed. And it to is, you, sir. And today's a today's an historic day. An historic day. An historic day. I even said it properly. An historic. Yes. It's an because it's not because it has that H in the front. Yeah, yeah. Which usually is reserved for the vowels, but H is an honorary vowel. It's, it's, it's like an Y in most cases. Exactly. 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 You know. You know the English language. You have, you have a you have a stout understanding of the English language. I would say. Look, here's the thing. Is English my first language? Yes. Do I still struggle with it day to day? Absolutely. I mean, do I get weird, obscure rules? Yes, I also do that. A 100% understanding of the most obscure aspects of the English language? Mm-hmm. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. So, this is episode 51 of Duels and Manadorks. What? what? Ooh. Again, welcome to Duels and Manadorks. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. So we kind of got the same little bit at the beginning. A little bit. Little but we're, we're doing a rebrand. Rebrand. We're doing a rebrand. Uh, the Dungeon Bros podcast, if you look at that on a podcasting service of your choice. Around the globe. Around the globe. Which, by the way, they are available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Microwave Ovens. Uh, also available on YouTube and YouTube Music. Mm-hmm. Fun fact. So wherever podcasts are served, you can get served. The Dungeon Bros podcast. Or more accurately... The Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. We, we've done a little bit of a rebrand. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you look at a podcast and you see Dungeon Bros podcast, you look at that and you think, who the fuck are the Dungeon Bros? We don't care about them. Whereas if you look at uh, a podcast and you see Duels and Mana Dorks, a and d and MTG podcast... You kind of understand what it's about. You might want to. You might want to check it out. Yeah, and because and okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get into this a little bit, but we want to thank our sponsor today. Uh, sponsor for the for duels and man. Oh, it's gonna be so impossible to get out of the habit of saying the Dungeon, Dungeon Bros, Bros podcast. podcast. Yeah. So the sponsor for the inaugural episode of the Duels and Man Dorks podcast is uh, Love a Rebrand. Rebrand your podcast today. Love a Rebrand has really been helping us with rebranding the Dungeon Bros podcast to. The Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. They've helped with some suggestions such as uh, making the acronym of the podcast D and D. Duels and Dorks. Mana Dorks. You have a little you have like a little insert line with mana. You had to draw it out for me because I am an adult. Indeed an you idiot, are. idiot or a daft fool. I've been telling people this for decades now. This is sh- for decades. Decades. <laughs> for decades now. Yes. Okay. It quick sidebar. <laughs> quick sidebar. Uh, I'm 28. Yep. You are also 28. For another uh, another six days, yes. Yes, yes. Um, decades yep. implies more than one. Uh huh. So that means we would have had to have met prior to the age of eight. Indeed. Um, for those of you that don't know our history, that's not even kind of <laughs> accurate. That's not even remotely true. And decade would even be a little bit far fetched if we're being completely honest with ourselves. I'm telling people this for millennia. <laughs> all right, all right, easy, easy there, Pharaoh. Okay. I don't need you to send me the fucking Shadow Realm or anything. Yu-Gi-Oh! Yes, that is that is the reference. Anyway, love a rebrand. We appreciate it. They've helped us with a little bit of the, the details, minutia of the new name. As we mentioned before, D and D. Mm-hmm. Of course, it is about D and D. Duels, of course, meaning the dual land and the two hosts of Whoa. the podcast. Whoa. As well as Mana Dorks being a reference to the Mana Dork card. Uh, it's a colloquialism for a creature that taps for a mana. Yes. Uh, generally a low power toughness creature, one that would not be attacking or defending. It is simply used to tap for mana. So many entendres. Uh, and then we're fucking dorks. So indeed we are. There's like a triple entendre. But again, I want to thank the sponsor of the of this, the inaugural episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. Love a rebrand. Rebrand your podcast today for the low, low price of eternal servitude to the dark depths of the dark one and the dark entities Con- Connor, of the world. Connor, and you Con- got what? What? Wait, we gotta oh, get on. Yeah. What are we doing? Uh, we're going on with the rest of the episode. Epi- oh, we're doing the podcast. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> How you been, Sam? <laughs> what's what's been going on with you? Oh God, How, what it? Uh, you know, I went to. Here's the thing. That was a really dumb bit. I'm sorry. That was a great. That was a that was a great dumb bit. Of dumb bits, that was probably one of the dumbest we've done. That was one of the dumb dumbest and one of the better ones. Okay. This is, a, this is a complete side tangent. The cat is obsessed with a brand new toy. The brand new toy is this piece of string. Mm-hmm. Probably about what? I'm a, I'm a man, so that's probably like, what, 10 to 12 inches? Something like that. It's m- more massive than you could possibly imagine. It's more accurately close to like seven. Yeah, something. It's right um, there. I chopped, I had, I had, br- I got bracers for the Renaissance. We both went to the Renaissance Fair. Mm-hmm. Not together, separately. Indeed. On different weekends. But it was a fun time. The Ohio Renaissance Festival. 
highly highly recommend. We'll get into that. But I had bracers, and they had they're like the the worst kind of bracers where you have to like tie them off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a lot of excess, so I chopped I chopped a lot of the excess off. And one of the strings I managed to get into the garbage before the cat got the other the other piece of string on the bottom of this bracer. And now it is her most favorite toy, her most prized possession. So we're just going to get that out of the room. She does like to chase it, which she has not done this immediate moment. Uh, that's because I distracted her by letting her attack my sock while I threw it out of the door. Fair so enough. So she couldn't see that it was moved. Uh, but yeah, we both went to the Ohio Renaissance Festival. It's mm-hmm. very much a vibe. It is a vibe. It is, uh, as one of my friends was saying on our way down, or way up. We yeah, go, no, we got to go north. north. It's like an hour north, or 45 minutes north. Depending Long on enough, traffic. Yeah, but... Uh, 45 minutes to get there, another 10 probably to get parking. It's one of the few places in uh, uh, in, in modern society... Where people can have uninhibited joy for their weirdness. His other example like was Gen Con. Gen Con, uh, anime conventions. Yes. Comic book conventions, that kind of thing. Where it's like, you know, usually if you dressed up in what you might dress up for a cosplay at these events, you'd get, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I have, sorry, it's fall now. Yeah, we got the, <coughs> oh god, he's dying. <laughs> Okay. Sam, uh, why did, Sam, why did you have this dark voice coming out of your mouth for a moment? That was weird. That, that and then was, you coughed it out, and it was fine. Uh, <laughs> but these places, uh, you can, you know, if you if you were to dress as you were, just to go to the, nobody goes to malls any day. If you were to go to the Chick Fil A, in full armor, people would look at you funny. Yeah, especially because like the the hyper Christians are probably not fond of uh, the eccentricities of the people that would go to these sorts of gatherings. Exactly. You know, they might be okay with like the fully armored knight because the Crusades, but whatever. Yeah, I mean, they, who who doesn't love a holy war? You know. Yeah. You you win the first one, you lose I'm the next sorry. several. Given given the current state of the world, I don't think we should be talking about holy wars with such flippancy. That is fair. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about that. That is not the. That's not this podcast at all. But I bought a hat there. You bought a hat. I bought a pirate hat. Nice, nice. Uh, I bought two major things. Obviously, quite a bit of quite a bit of food. Quite a bit of beverage. Actually, not nearly as much food as I was planning, but quite a bit of beverage. Indeed. Got a nice got a nice like ceramic mug that I was able to clip to the leather belt that I bought. Mm-hmm. Which this if women may not know this about men, but a good leather belt is probably like fifty dollars. Like a good yeah. quality leather belt. This this build this small building shop, this leather worker, our friend Lincoln pointed it out to me when I was saying I want to get a belt, mm-hmm. and I got it fantasy. I got it like uh, costume style, so like it had a long tail at the end, so I could like loop it through and then get you know yeah you know. But this guy in fifteen minutes, one on one conversation with me, got to pick the thickness of the belt the color of the dye for the leather Mm -hmm. he then handed me like a measurement belt to be like cinch it so that it's comfortable found that spot marked it and then marked three notches above and below so for variance in your body size um measured all of that punched the holes cut the sides of the belt uh freaking burnished to the ends let me pick out a buckle put the buckle on like all of the decisions and the entire process of mm-hmm. making it, in addition to buying a nice little leather loop with a snap so that I could put my new ceramic mug snapped onto it, the whole process fifteen minutes, forty five dollars. Yeah, that's pretty good. That it was it was an experience, probably the nicest belt I'll ever own. <laughs> if I were to go back, I'd probably get like one that because you get the you get the option to have it cut like a normal belt so you can wear it like with your pants and like a nice outfit which mm-hmm. I don't wear jeans very often sure so I don't really have a need for a belt very often uh, if I were to go back I wouldn't I I would totally be fine with buying another belt that is cut that way just mm. for normal the reason I got the belt uh, is because well I'm fucking sorted now you do have a sword I don't know if this is breaking TikToks um, it is a prop sword TikTok. it is prop it is blunted it is not sharp in any way but this is a fully metal sword that has that is uh, stainless steel, not sharp in any way. I'm gonna. That's the sound of me running my hand on the edge and not cutting myself because I want the camera. But yeah, full metal sword. For those of you that don't know, uh, it is Andoril, Flame of the West, forged from the shards of Narsil, Lord of the Rings. It's the it's the Aragorn sword at the end. It's really fucking cool. I am obsessed with this thing. 
to no end. The reason I got the leather belt, so I could wear it on my hip after buying it. That's literally the only reason I got that belt. There you go. I also got this one like 20% off because it was the last one and it was like the show one that they were using. And I was like, I mean, looks fucking fine to me. <laughs> so, hey, you know, you know, uh, the cat, of course, obsessed with the sheath of this sword as well as the sword because we have foam swords that we play with the cat. Yes. I, I use to play with the cat. And we're just going to set that down. And uh, now that I have a metal one, she thinks that she can play with this one as well. Yeah, she she doesn't understand what is a toy and what is not, mostly yeah. because uh, she's a cat. Yeah, and she can she'll play with anything and anything Absolutely. and everything. But uh, I love this thing. No. I need to. Oh, don't you dare jump up on the. She was about. She was looking at the end of this sword like I'm gonna fuck the end of that sword up so bad. Like no, this the end of this sword will fuck you up, Jester. <laughs> you don't. You weigh as much as the sword cat. Literally less than the sword. <laughs> sheathed baby all right we're gonna put that down now i just need to get like a nice wooden like wall mount for it so that i can hang it up on the wall you do and then it will look nice probably in the living room where where the setup is with all of the things and everybody can see it when they come over to our house indeed indeed uh, a couple things we want to do before we get into the meat we're going to be talking of course about the one dnd play test for the bastions uh the first dungeon masters guide related uh, item in mm -hmm. the one DD play test. Very exciting. There's also cantrips there, and I'm more excited for the cantrips personally. <laughs> Honestly, yes. Especially because they've been doing what we've been saying on previous episodes of the podcast, formerly known as the Dungeon Bros Podcast, now Duels and Manadors. But the Doctor Who Commander decks were revealed. Yeah. Uh, we've actually seen quite a few different, uh, or we saw that the professor got to do a shuffle up and play, his podcast, or his, uh, his actual play of the using the commander decks. Yeah. Um, I don't want any of the decks, to be honest with you. No, not at all. There are several cards that are pretty good uh, for different things across them. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good reprints as well. Mm -hmm. All with all with art. Their universe is beyond, so all the art is new. That was the exciting thing about Lord of the Rings. Even the reprints had fancy Lord of the Rings themed art. But there's a couple new design cards that are going to probably crack a couple formats open a little bit. And uh, there's going to be some new staples that are going to be Doctor Who cards. Yeah. So be that what it may. Not going to be buying any of the decks, probably. <laughs> right. Just going to be buying uh, yeah, singles when you know people start opening up and selling them immediately. I could see you doing a, uh, a Doctor-themed deck where you've got a lot of the doctor, All the doctors. The doctors, the companions, all that kind of stuff. You're much more into this than I am. And by much more, I mean you're into it and I am not. I mean, I enjoy it. I also like the mechanic that they've introduced with the Doctor and the Doctor's companions, where it's as long as you have a Doctor, you mm -hmm. can have one of the one of the companions as their as a second commander. Yeah, and I think uh, it was it, it's like a weird combination of like partner and background, mm -hmm. but also it's associated with a creature type as opposed to a keyword ability. Yeah, so it's like any any Doctor. So if they end theoretically hypothetically in the future if they released a set and there was a new creature type introduced like that is called doctor much mm -hmm. like how there's the advisor creature type then that would technically also be compatible with the doctor who doctor companions cards mm. which was interesting fun little fun little thing we'll need to keep an eye on that in the next decade when you know magic 40 right magic 40 but yeah so that opens up a lot of different avenues for new deck building i the built the the cards in them in the set itself most of them aren't high powered and the commanders themselves are very niche um that being said there are individual cards that can definitely ramp a lot of strategies or fit nicely into a lot of strategies mm -hmm. um but yeah over i mean the 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 set itself being that it's a commander product a universe beyond it's not super powerful yeah which i mean no one at least i wasn't really expecting that Obviously, their really powerful ones are going to be things like the Commander Masters decks, which I think were all pretty powerful. Planeswalker won the least powerful amongst them, I would say. I'd say, I mean, that's that's generally how a Planeswalker Yeah. Uh, ironically, works. the one that people were least excited about, the Enchantment Precon, I think is by far the most powerful of them. Like, Slivers is going to draw too much attention. Eldrazi takes too long to get going. 
But that that you're in, you got the enchantment one, and that one ramps it w- ramps out one, and then two, it just it stays consistent the whole game. Oh yeah, you can rebuild your board so fast after it a wipe. Is, oh my god, it is so because the commander of the enchantment precon love it, Anicthia, Hand of Erebos. She, if you're able to recast her, which there's so much ramp in the deck that mm-hmm. it's very easy to have enough mana to recast her multiple times, like hard recast her. Yeah. And then her entering the battlefield and then also attacking is pulling enchantments out of your grave, exiling them and getting copies of your enchantments out of your graveyard. So very easy to rebuild a board state. And then also giving your sagas, your base enchantment, anything that's not an aura based enchantment, making it a three, three creature with menace now as well. So, and it's funny because each time you've played that you've gone, Oh wait, I didn't realize this synergy. Like there's, this does this, and that triggers this, which means I get another copy. There's so many cards that work so well together. Mm-hmm. Fa- and anyway, that's a tangent. Doctor Who Commander decks. If you're into that sort of thing, have it. I've seen some comments from people on like Twitter and stuff where they're like, "I'm only vaguely into. Me- uh, I've, I've been interested in Doctor Who, kind of, but the cards now make me want to watch the show, which I think is very fucking weird. But I mean, hey, if more you- power to you. I, that's that's one thing I think a lot of uh, nerd related stuff will often do. <clears throat> uh, if you ever watch, oh, it's the call. It's not college humor anymore. Dropouts. Um, actually. Oh yes. Uh, you watch on um actually, and you're like, they're like, really obscure, in depth question about something you've never heard of before. Um, Here's the answer. Well, now I kind of gotta go check that out because that sounds <laughs> awesome. I know, right? And it never is as awesome as it sounds, usually, I would say. I mean, you know, you got you got to pick and choose what you what you want to put your time to. I, I That's understandable. That's fair. That's fair. Um, one more thing. Magic 30. We've talked a, at nauseam about how fucking bad that, bad. that yes. product was, how expensive, how it was awful. Uh, Jester, Jesper Mirforce, M-Y-R... F O R S. That is an awesome last name, by the way. That is an awesome last name. Uh, Jesper was an artist for Match of the Gathering way back in the day. Way, way back in the day. And uh, they made a post on, what would that be? Sunday the 8th, October 8th. To two, yeah, a couple days ago. Is when they noticed that one of the cards that they had designed, the art for, mm-hmm. that is, was reprinted in Magic 30. Jesper owns the copyright for all of their art for Magic the Gathering cards. All of all of the all the and a lot of artists from that era did. Mm-hmm. Obviously, modern modern art that's done for Wizards of the Coast in Magic the Gathering, Wizards owns all of that art. Yes, they own the copyright to that. They art. buy that art. So when you look at the, he put up this image, uh, a public notice to anyone that was an artist in that era. He pulls up his original copy of the card with his art. And then where it has the illustrated by and then it has his name, it also puts the copyright logo with it so that you know that it is his copyright. With the reprint in Magic 30 that they did, they formatted it how they do for regular cards. Mm -hmm. So it's illustrated and then it has like the little arrowhead symbol and then the artist's name. And then the copyright is attributed to Wizards of the Coast, which they do not own the copyright to that art. Um I'm just going to read his, I'm just going to read the Facebook post real quick. Quote, I have a public announcement to make concerning Magic th- the 30th edition release of Magic the Gathering. Yes, I reached out to Wizards of the Coast. No, I did not get a response. Every Magic the Gathering artist who did not sell their rights needs to be made aware of this. Edit. I'm pretty sure this was an oversight on the part of Wizards of the Coast. I'm making this post simply to publicly state the actual facts and to protect my copyrights. I'm disappointed with this turn of events, but I am not angry. I really appreciate the outpouring of support, but as of now, there is no talk of lawsuits or anything drastic. I will keep you posted as things develop. Thank you again. Um... One of the top comments is, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if current Watsi are unaware of the intricacies of the copyright. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, work, I, I work for an insurance company, and uh, and I work in, in dealing with uh, formatting things for, like, contracts and stuff. And there's so much that comes down from legal that's like, I haven't – they're like, you have to do it this way. I'm like, I have no idea why, but I have to say yes, so okay. Um so I can definitely see just somebody was, you know, somebody told, hey, you over there, make it so that Goblin King is on the Magic 30 card. And he's like, all right, I'll yeah. do that. 
And then they just did all the regular formatting and didn't understand that. Wasn't told. Wasn't told. I wouldn't even be surprised if the person that told them didn't know. Yeah. Or if really anybody at Wizards knew who owned the copyrights of any of those alpha, beta, and unlimited cards. Right. You know. Anyway, that's all. That, that, that's that's enough waffling at the top. Those are just things we wanted to mention because today we're going to be talking very deeply about the Bastion system for the Dungeon Master's Guide One D and D Play Test Indeed. that they just put out a couple of days ago. Uh, of course, before we get into that, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. It's going to take a while to get used to that. Uh, it's going to be available on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, the YouTube channel as well. Uh, we also have a TikTok and Instagram. All of that kind of jazz. You can get our Amazon store, merch store. We do Monday night magic live streams every week on Monday. Mm-hmm. Match the Gathering. Last night we did uh, pl- we did a jump start for the first I'm time sorry, in a while. Yep. Your deck was your two halves were very synergistic. Smashing doctors. Yes, uh, mine were not. The tree hugging archaeology. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no. Those those were two very different strategies that did not mesh well together. That's at all. Uh, but it's always a good time. We also got the, our deck lists for all of our commander decks on Moxfield. We probably need to update them. It's been a couple months. Yeah, it's likely. But they're, for the most part, what they are. Uh, upcoming releases as of, let's see, next week, as of the release of this podcast, we're going to get Planescape, Adventures in the Multiverse. It's going to be like a little three-book bundle. We talked about that recently. We're Apparently, it's reviewing quite well from people that have gotten early access copies of it. But, of course, we we're concerned since the last time they did a three-book bundle release uh, that was the... Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Spell jammers. Mm-hmm. And that was a fucking mess all the way around. And the books were not good. <laughs> so uh, then we got the Book of Many Things, which is going to be November 14th. And then at the beginning of next year, probably around March, is when we're going to start to get the 1D, we're going to get the 1D and D core rule books. Yep. That's when, that's when shit's going to get really fun. Uh, the Doctor Who Commander decks are coming out next week. Actually, no, this week, October 13th. Then we're going to get the Lord of the Rings winter release where we're getting the the fancy like art card mosaics, which, by the way, are new card designs, and they're really fucking powerful. They are. Uh, we good. talked about it on a previous podcast as well. Uh, Lost Caverns of Vixalon is going to be November 17th, and then Ravnica Remastered January 12th. Let's get into this UA. All right. So, playtest is... Eight bastions and cantrips. They wanted to get. They wanted to do revised cantrips, and they didn't want to wait until the next player's handbook playtest. So they just lumped it in here. The cantrips are the thing I'm most excited about. But they wanted to create a a subsystem in that's going to be in the Dungeon Master's Guide specifically for uh, basically building your own fort, your own castle, whatever. They call it bastions, and they call the system the bastion system. Uh, the whole idea of this system is, if you look at Xanathar's Guide to Everything, mm-hmm. there's a lot of downtime systems there of like potion craft, of making magic items, of training to gain feats, that kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of those, a lot of those features, you as a character, like if you're training to get a feat, your character needs to be training to get a feat. Yeah. But there's no reason that your character couldn't hire someone to craft a magic item for you, and. They wanted to make a system where you could have your own place, build your own fortress with your own people, uh, and then create facilities that give you special features where you can use them to craft magic items, to make you money, to create potions, to build teleportation circles, to do any sort of thing. Tons of different options. Um, the bra- Generally, the breakdown is... There's gold piece requirements to both grow and create new facilities, grow the size of your bastion, mm-hmm. create new facilities. Uh, you get you basically just get general hirelings that you can every week. General uh, give, hirelings? Yes, general hirelings. Uh, every week you can give your bastion an order, and then they will execute on whatever that order is. So for a week, the order might be craft, and then uh, different facilities, when you give the craft order, do different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like a, an arcane... Uh, an, an artifice facility type thing would be building you a magic item or crafting you a potion. Uh, you can also do things like repair, which is going to be like a maintenance part of your bastion. But also repairing is going to help make cheaper when you try to expand. It, there's so many deep systems here that we're not going to get into all of the yeah. minutia of it. You're able to generate money, all this kind of things. Uh, there's also a random events table so that your DM, while you know, the player characters are away, 
can have random events happening so you return and it's like why the fuck is that wall destroyed mm-hmm. what happened so like the 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 bastion and your fortress are living without you you all just own it and kind of control and operate it so sam what are, what do you think of this entire system it's 20 pages it's very detailed the bastion gets turns which happen every seven days uh there's gold piece requirements which are honestly fairly Fairly reasonable reasonable. that wow (laughs) we got a fucking damn okay uh oh of course accumulating bastion points is what you can spend to create uh various magic items and stuff uh you can also use it for like um Spreading the word of their heroic deeds uh, gives you advantage on charisma checks while you're near the Bastion. Uh, You can spend it to... um, Oh my god, when a character dies, the character can spend 100 Bastion points to return to life in their Bastion at the next dawn? But they can't use that again until they level up at least one level. What the fuck? Okay, I didn't read that particular sentence, but that's (laughs) wild. Um... But yeah, but the maintain is what will help rebuild the Bastion. That's also how you accrue Bastion points that you can then spend on other things. There's a lot of systems here. We have a bad habit of um, getting a little bit too in the weeds on these playtests, yeah. so we're not going to here. We're just kind of giving an overview, talking about some of the the options that are available. So what what is your preliminary thoughts here? Uh, I think that this is a... This is something that I think every... D&D campaign somehow wants to work in characters, characters, players, players who play characters uh, love to live out their fantasies. That's that's true. In this fantasy role playing game where you play characters in a fantasy setting. Yes. And one of those fantasies uh, is, of course, land ownership. (laughs) The millennial fantasy of of land ownership, for sure. Um, And as we'll talk about a little later, uh, Matt Colville and team did from MCDM did Strongholds and Followers, which we have here in front of us. We'll get into that in a moment. Uh, And I think that this this whole idea uh, ramps is pretty good for just start dropping it into a a vanilla D&D campaign and then could ramp into something like Strongholds and Followers if that's what you're, you know, you're... uh, table decides to do but other than that it's a great way to continue to give your players you know rewards things to spend gold on and uh give them more what's the word ownership over the game itself yeah um i agree i agree i like i like having like a home base a place to go back to especially a lot of adventures where it's like if you're running a campaign book you're probably not going to be able to incorporate a Bastion kind of system right. because you're going from one place to the next and you're telling a story and you can tell stories, but you can also have like moments of reset in like homebrew campaigns or just general open campaign settings where you're kind of figuring out things as you go along, uh, where you can go back and have like a reset session at your home base. I think also in homebrew campaigns, uh, as far as like the the dungeon master who creates it. You know, that's the setting of a single city is usually easier to maintain the idea of than an entire continent. You're going to have you're going to have, you know, aspects of all that throughout. But, you know, for the Netherdeep campaign that you want to run. Yeah. Matt Mercer's already created these 14 locations. Exactly. Me. I'll create them when I need to be, but I've already created this one city, so I might as well sit here for a hot second. Exactly, exactly. Uh, The Bastion, you get to make look however you want. Uh, You also get... When when the players gain a Bastion, they start with two basic facilities and then two special facilities. Basic facilities are your things like bedrooms, courtyards, kitchens, parlor, store, that kind of stuff. You're not really doing much there. Uh, it might be a nice place to like start a session like in the dining hall adjacent to the kitchen. It might give you the opportunity to introduce like a chef character that later on down the line with special facilities, you can then utilize the expertise of that mm. character to be doing things for you. Uh, but then the more you, you can also add new basic facilities for fairly cheap. You can get small rooms for 500 gold pieces. Takes 20 days. Uh, roomier spaces which are up to 16 squares like 16 five foot squares you can arrange it however you want you can stack them if you want multiple floors and that as well Uh, for a thousand gold pieces 45 days vast is even more it's up to 32 squares 3,000 gold 125 days you can also spend lesser amounts 
and lesser time and less time to up a cramped room to a roomy and then roomy to a vast space. Uh, special facilities, you are limited based on the level of your party. A uh, level five party can only have two special facilities, level nine, four, level 13, five, and level 17. You can have up to six. Uh, they all have special requirements. Generally, the prerequisites is uh, the character that is creating the special facility needs to have a certain class feature. Uh, class features can, of course, span across multiple classes. Mm. So there's multiple class. There's certain classes that are going to have more access to facilities, like a ranger or a paladin that's got martial features and spellcasting features are probably going to have the access to most facilities out of all of the classes. Um, that being said, a majority of the options are for anybody. Exactly. Uh, some examples of some of the special facilities are things like uh, level five facilities include things like the arcane study. You have to have an arcane focus. Uh, the ability to use an arcane focus as a spellcasting focus to be able to create that one. Some that don't require prerequisites are like an armory, a barracks, a library, a storehouse, that kind of stuff. Workshop requires the expertise, expertise in a skill. Smithy requires a fighting style or unarmored defense. Uh, you need a holy symbol or, or a druidic focus as a spellcasting focus to get a sanctuary. Um, they have certain orders that you give will allow them to uh, do certain things. And then you get up to like the very high level, very high level abilities where like level 17 ability is demiplane, the ability to use an arcane focus or a spellcasting focus where you get a demiplane mm -hmm. <laughs> in your, in your, uh, in your bastion. Uh, one of the cool level nine features that I really like is, or special facilities is the teleportation circle. Yeah. I think that's one, like something as simple as having a teleportation circle and being very easily able to get back to your home. I like that it's a very, a fairly low level, level nine. I don't even think you're able to cast the teleportation circle spell at that point, or you like just gained the ability. Yeah. It's to. one or the other, but we're just gonna we're just gonna look at uh, details of a couple of these uh, facilities. Let's let's just do the arcane study. We kind of talked about it already. Prerequisite: the ability to use an arcane focus as a spellcasting focus requires a roomy space. Needs one hireling, uh, and then the order that is associated with it is craft, where you get one to four. Uh, you roll a 1d4 to get bastion points that you can later spend. An arcane study is a place of quiet research that contains one or more desks and bookshelves. When you if when you issue the craft order to this facility, you can choose one of the following options. You can craft an arcane focus. You commission the facility's hirelings to craft an arcane focus. The work takes seven days and costs no money. The arcane focus remains in your bastion until you claim it, or you can have it sold for 10 gold pieces. You can also craft a book. You commission the facility's hirelings to craft a blank book. The work takes seven days and costs 10 gold pieces. The book remains in the bastion until you claim it, or you can have it sold for 25. The arcane study also imparts the following benefit. Cast Identify. After spending a long rest in your bastion, you can cast Identify once within the next seven days without expending a spell slot or using material components. A basic facility. Yes. Giving you some basic benefits. Then, if we look at a much higher level, level 13, the archive, next alphabetically, that's very literally convenient. the only re yes. literally the only reason that I chose this uh, it doesn't have any prerequisite requires a roomy space it has one hireling uh, the order is research where you get one d8 bastion points it's a repository for valuable books scrolls and maps it's usually attached to a library behind a locked or secret door ooh uh, God, we spend way too much time together <laughs> Uh, your archive contains one copy of a rare and valuable reference book chosen from the options in the reference books table below. Let's look at some of these. Bigby's Handy Arcane Arcana Codex. You have advantage on any intelligence arcana check you make when you take the study action to recall lore about spells, magic items, elder symbols, magical traditions, and planes of existence. You also get, uh, let's see, let's pick another one. Uh, material musings on the nature of worldly things. Love the names, by the way. They're great names They're for you have advantage on any intelligence nature check you make when you take the study action. Basically, the book that you choose gives you advantage on a different skill check being arcana, history, investigation, nature, or religion when you take the study action to learn about certain things. There's a whole bunch of different special facilities. Um, Sam, do you have any that you are particularly fond of, or or what do you think of the of the actual special features that you're getting from these bastions to begin with? I think that the bastion features are thankfully very um, what's the word like 
sneakily powerful i think is the the term yeah, i kind of want to use okay, yeah i think because uh, like we were talking about we've i've you know i've run a game where this we've used the strongholds and followers book and i definitely think at points there was a misinterpretation of how much power this thing should grant you yeah um and yeah level 13 you've spent probably a lot of money at this point uh tons tons of money to you know to level to get you get this the proper sized room but it only you know and it takes a week to make this thing that gives you advantage on nature checks Mm -hmm. which yeah again at at base level doesn't seem that powerful because there's other ways to do it but at the same time you know once you have that you have that you have now you've you've given yourself just blanket advantage for the next several levels yeah um and the fact is you can combine these and use these and the best part about it is you can these happen while you're away you don't have to have a a your character sitting and doing these the entire time yeah which a lot of games may not necessarily focus on or the fact that you can just take downtime but if you have a game where you're running and you're on the clock, and especially at like higher levels, once you hit ninth level, you're going to be dealing with a lot more world-ending or uh, uh, more time-intensive yeah. events going on that you don't really want to be like, all right, let's take a week and craft a scroll. Right, exactly. It's like, oh, all right. Well, in that case, the uh, town you were you were uh, sent to go save, though well, they've been burnt to the ground. So, yeah. yeah. Venture over, <laughs> venture over. Yeah, sorry. Um, I do. I also want one more, one more facility. I want to shout out here: mm-hmm. the gambling hall, mm-hmm. the gaming hall, technically, which can be turned into a gambling den. Well, it is. I mean, that's. I mean, that's basically what it is. But uh, level nine facility, no prerequisite. Requires a vast space with four hirelings. Uh, the order is the trade order, where you get one d six action points. Offers recreational activities ranging from chessboards to darts to card games and dice. When you issue the trade order, you commission the facility's hirelings to turn the gaming hall into a gambling den for a week. At the end of the seventh day, you roll a percentile dice and consult the table to determine the winnings for the house. Which, if you roll in the bottom third, 1 to 33, you only get 3d6 gold. That's up to 18 gold. Yeah, up to 18 gold, nothing crazy. But... 34 to 50, you get 1d6 times 10, so 10 to 60. Then, what would that be? 20 to 120. Then 40 to 208. No. Yes. 280. Then 100 to 6,000. Yeah. If you if you roll 96 to 100, or 96 to 00, zero you can get up to 6,000 gold. Which is pretty good. Which is very good. A just, minimum of 100 gold. So it's a, just a nice little passive. Like, I I feel like the the gaming hall would be the one, like, when you get to level 9 and you get a new facility, you open up the gaming hall. Mm-hmm. Because then you can just be passively every week gaining more money that you can then reinvest into the facilities and upgrading them, getting new ones, getting more powerful ones, expanding the size, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And if you get lucky... Might be able to do it really quickly. Anyway, uh, Sam, you're the one that is much more familiar with MCDM's strongholds and followers. Yes. So I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you kind of take the lead here and just talk about what strongholds and followers is, and then we're gonna talk about a little bit of the differences because these are two very different systems. Well, not very, but similar yet aiming at different directions for the same kind of building a fortress type of. System. Yeah. So Strongholds and Followers, uh, it was kickstarted a couple years ago, came out through MCDM, uh, which is Matt Colville and his friend's company. And the idea behind it was kind of going, utilizing uh, the old the old ways of D&D and not the bad old ways of D&D, like... Uh, yeah, uh, bef- yeah, not the racist not, things. Not, and new, not new TSR things. <laughs> but the kind of idea of, you know, a, a spellcaster wants to level up they want to get very strong so they can cast wish you know that's the big thing as a spellcaster is eventually you're going to get to ninth level and you're going to be able to cast wish well what do you want to do as a fighter you don't you can't you know you want to level up you probably want to gain followers like that's what you want to do as a fighter you want to eventually become the the general of an army or something like Mm -hmm. that and that was kind of the idea behind strongholds and followers so the strongholds and followers uh 
book um, breaks down similarly types of strongholds you can have, how you can acquire one. Uh, the Bastion system kind of has the has a one week yeah. um, time scale. Strongholds and followers goes on a let's they call an extended rest, which is two weeks back at your at your stronghold. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know similarly what doing each of the different strongholds could acquire you power-wise. Uh, and then secondarily, there was the followers um, system. Which, this that's this is one of the big changes in systems. Of Like, the Bastions is literally like, here's hirelings, they just do generic things. And mm. then followers is like an entire other subsystem. Yeah. Uh, it was originally meant to be the, this is the first half of a of two-part series uh, the next one was Kingdoms and Warfare, which expanded that out into mass combat. And your mm -hmm. followers were supposed to have a bit more utility there, but they changed that up. Um, mass combat is its own other... It's, it's not really D&D. Like, at a certain point, you might just want to like shift over for a session and play a war game. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what, that, that's what this is. Uh, each of the different strongholds are based upon the class. Mm -hmm. So, as in, in uh, the Bastion system, you get to choose as long as you have the correct prerequisites, whereas uh, the MCDM version takes a lot more assumptions of what you're playing. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to, if you are a, if you are a bard, then you are going to, then, you know, it's going to, it's assuming you're going to want to build a performance space. You're a performative person. But that that is, that performance space is going to have benefits, letting you know more about uh, what rumors are going on because you have more people in there. Or the monks going to want to build a monastery because that's what monks do. Um, on top of that, the strongholds and followers wants to go much more into once when you are home, you are powerful. Mm -hmm. You are an entity to be. You know, when you're out in the world, sure you've got your you, know, you got some extra benefits, but at home, you know you're. Your stronghold is going to give you bonus things like a layer wood of a dragon. Um, for example, for the stronghold stronghold actions on the monk's monastery, until initiative count twenty on the next round, your skin becomes diamond. For the duration, you are immune to all but psychic damage um, and things like that. Basically, a if you're nearby, mm -hmm. if, if your if your place is getting assaulted, you're much more equipped, well equipped to defend it. Basically, exactly, yeah. Which is kind of the entire point of these systems is like you're there's something you care about that your DM can then <laughs> assault. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so again, that makes a lot more it, the the book itself makes a lot more assumptions about what you want to be doing as a player character. Um, also, the expenses in this book are a lot higher. Yeah. So acquiring like an acquiring uh, just a couple rooms in the Bastion system is a couple hundred gold, maybe a thousand for two small rooms. Yeah. Where this is like, yeah, you're going to need to spend, let's see if we can, if I can quickly find the page. If I recall, I had a wizard and I was building a tower and it was like tens of thousands of gold. Yeah. So stronghold construction, if you want to build it from base for a tower, it's 8,000 gold in 120 days. And that's level one. Yeah. That's uh four months. It's four months. Um, the difference here is you can also, as soon as you have the gold, you can start upgrading your things and getting more effects of those of your stronghold, yeah. as opposed to leveling uh, your character itself. So, ultimately, I feel like the main difference between like strongholds and followers was very very popular. Strongholds and followers seems like a like for one they needed to make a book, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then in that book. It's making the assumption that your entire campaign is going to be built around you creating your fortress, things happening to your fortress, you doing things at your fort. Like the yeah. entire the entire game is going to be centered around it and built around it. Whereas Bastions feels like it's more of a system where this is you can get some benefits from your downtime without actually having to take time away from your normal adventuring. Yes, and you get lesser benefits. It's easier to get those benefits. And it's a lot more. I would I would argue that the Bastion system is a bit more leaning into the. Um, this is just coloring your experience as opposed to dictating your experience. Yeah, I definitely think that the the Bastion. I mean, they said it in the I believe in the playtest and uh, on their video that they that Wizards does, where this can it can just be dropped into yeah. any sort of campaign. Whereas, yeah, the the strongholds and followers is supposed to lean more into. 
that's that's the idea is you're building this and then you're using this to influence and you're kind of having more uh you know you're not so much just going and adventuring obviously you can still go and adventure because things take time to happen yeah. but that being said the strongholds and followers uh leans more almost into a more political or more because you again they have the followers and then the kingdoms and warfare that comes next where it's like okay i'm your characters in tier two tier three definitely tier four of play oh yeah they have influence. They're not just being called upon by the king to go fight the dragon. They're being called upon by the king because you're now his greatest ally. Yeah. You know, you you yeah. When you were level five, you proved that you could fight a dragon, and so he gave you you know lots of gold, and now you've got a a dominion of your own. Yeah, you are a lord in this kingdom, and not only that, you are a lord that wields a lot of power mm-hmm. that you can then utilize that power in that sphere of influence to influence other nations and 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 and, and you're probably going to piss some of them off yeah and, yeah um which is actually it's interesting that the bastion does have like you said the random effects table which is actually a neat little a neat little random I effects love table that. Uh, if you want to you pull it up real quick and we'll go through it but only uh only one of the scroll 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 there it is Wait. yeah there was Oh, yes, yes, yes. You roll a d20. Half of it, nothing happens, basically. Yeah. 1 to 9, nothing happens. 10, there's an attack. 11 to 12, you've lost some hirelings. 13 to 14, you've taken on refugees. And then you have uh, 15 to 20 are uh, beneficial things. You get friendly visitors, requests for aid, honored guests, extraordinary opportunities, criminal hireling. Oh. And then uh, natural 20, you get a magical discovery. And you can get into all the details of that on your own. Uh, basically, like, you accidentally get a really good thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, honored guests are like, wonderful opportunities for role play, for your characters come back from their adventure, and then there's, like, this new dynamic that maybe nobody was planning on, including right. the DM, <laughs> which is a lot of the fun too. So, we're, we're, I feel and we'll, we'll wrap up our, our comments on bastions and strongholds and followers. If you want to take a look at the quick TikTok live chat for yeah. a sec, uh, every week or every two weeks when we record the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, we go live on the TikTok and then we requisition questions from the TikTok live chat. We answer general questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and/or ideas about whatever the audience wants to talk about at the end of the podcast. But I want to try to incorporate a little bit more into the the meat of the podcast because it's more topical right now to be answering questions about bastions and strongholds and such. Do you have anything good? Uh, there's there's a lot of magic questions. So we'll get to those at the end. Um, but out of print GM, and I'll, I'll kind of let us, I'll, I'll use this as a stepping point to talk about it. Out of print GM asks, okay, what's your favorite historical period and, and have would you run a game set then? Which I think actually does lend uh, nicely into a discussion. Like we could talk about that using this. There are certain settings that probably wouldn't lend themselves very well to a even a Bastion. Definitely not a Strongholds game, but yeah. even a Bastion. Like if you're playing in Barovia. Yeah, you're not. You're not making a Bastion in Barovia. No. Um, or but if you're if you're in a very classic feudal medieval Europe. Yeah. sort of idea i okay so actual real historical things i feel like a feudal japan style like warring factions and lords and stuff would really lend itself very heavily to a bash like a very thematic mm-hmm. bastion or stronghold style of campaign which i mean is its own thing so it, it, it what do you and your players want out of your D is ultimately what it comes down to i also think that so i've been thinking about um in a American colonial times sort of thing. Oh, yeah. With the idea like of... Assassin's Creed 3? Assassin's Creed, uh, yeah, 3 or even 4, or yeah, even Black Flag. Oh, yeah. But the idea of you start the campaign, and maybe for the first, like, half the campaign, it's just you're trying to go from one coast to the other because there's, there's gold over there. You know, suddenly land travel is possible, now you're going to the gold rush. I wouldn't... I would, however, or like to continue that you know if you get to the end of the the campaign often people time you know times people love their characters but maybe it's like okay you've made it to the other side of the country or the continent well you're level 10 now why don't we switch gears and now start focusing on okay now you can start building your own bastion your own your own own empire your own yeah exactly exactly and then 
it's a fun thing where it's like you can go on one last big adventure where now you've got some skin in the game, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and then in a future campaign, it's like one of the cities, like 100 years down the line, it was the stronghold that you built. And yeah. like one of the NPCs might be one of the characters. And then you can go back for a one shot when they're a lot older and they're like defending a kingdom that they've built, like that kind of stuff. It opens up a lot of fantastic opportunities. Do you have any final thoughts on the Bastion system? I would be, I'm excited to utilize it. I'm excited to see how it goes, but I like I'm it. I like it. I'm a big fan. I'm a very big fan of it. I, I like that it's a lot more low key. I like that it's cheap. I like that it doesn't take a lot of time. Uh, Strongholds and Followers is great. You need a campaign where you're mm -hmm. building around that, whereas the Bastion system is something that you can more easily just drop in. Yes. Uh, which I think is really good for just a Dungeon Master's Guide inclusion. Absolutely what should be in core rule books. Absolutely. Strongholds and Followers makes sense as a third-party supplement. Third-party supplement. If if D D wanted to expand on it, I wouldn't even be opposed to like a Xanathar-style rules supplement that is built around Bastions mm -hmm. and Hirelings and stuff. I would totally be okay with that. That's a cool product idea, as opposed to a lot of the shit that they're making right now. Anyway, the other half of this UA is the the part that I'm that I think I am much more excited for, which yeah. is the cantrips. We have talked ad nauseum about cantrips, particularly the bad ones. Oh yeah, uh, we they have included a a small collection of cantrips that are all very much well, are very much redesigned. We're just gonna go through the design notes here for the spells. We've got acid splash. Now is a five foot radius sphere that it can affect any creature caught within it, and it is an evocation instead of a conjuration spell. The school change unites this spell with the sorcerer and wizard's other direct damage acid spells. Uh, so your evocation wizard is going to benefit from it. Your your sorcerer is going to benefit from it. Acid splash, create an ac acidic bubble. Hurl it at a point within range where it explodes into a five foot radius sphere. You'll be able to hit four squares with this mm -hmm. if you aim it at the intersection of those four squares meaning you can hit up to four creatures which it used to only max out i believe one creature and then a creature directly next to it i believe so uh again they still have to make a dexterity saving throw or they take 1d6 acid damage range of 60 feet requires an action it's really nice because there's not a lot of uh, playing Baldur's skate recently there's not a lot of low level aoe spells mm -hmm. and a cantrip it's not a great cantrip and acid uh resistance is actually pretty common yeah but that Fairly. being said Fucking take out four goblins once with one cantrip. That's great. I, I think love that. That's, that's a great investment. Like it makes it it makes it worth taking over firebolt. Mm. You know, firebolt is the quintessential cantrip for wizards and sorcerers for a reason. Yes, it is just the most damage. It's the most direct. It's the most. It makes the most sense. Acid splash now offers something unique and different that warrants taking the damage debuff. Yes, from Firebolt, uh, Blade Ward, one of the ones I am most excited for, is now a reaction that imposes disadvantage on a creature's melee attack roll. Blade Ward reaction, which you take in response to a visible creature targeting you with a melee attack, you target yourself. You trace a sigil of warding, imposing disadvantage on the creature's attack roll against you. Blade Ward now becomes a very highly really want to take cantrip. Mm -hmm. uh, re we, we've talked ad nauseum about the action economy of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Bonus action, action, reaction are the main things that you're taking. You're obviously taking an action every turn. A lot of creatures get access to bonus action things, be they spells, be they features, all of that. Reaction based features are a lot more rare and a yep. lot of them are tied to using spell slots they are yes now you have a cantrip so if you're a low level wizard you might not be wanting to save your first level spot for shield now you can just have blade ward and just if you're if someone runs up to you and attacks you you know you always have an option to defend yourself with your reaction which is fucking awesome and there's, I can see a lot of, there are so many ways for you to get cantrips. There are so many, like, one-level dips where it's like, oh, I have now, now access, so I could get, take a can For so many characters, this is a viable option now. This, 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 along with one of the other cantrips that we're going to talk about later, have really highly buffed mm -hmm. classes like the Eldritch Knight Fighter, yeah. like the Hexblade Warlock, the Blade Singer Wizard. We'll get into that in a little bit. Next, Chill Touch is now a touch spell. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Instead of creating this spectral hand that goes out and touches something, you now touch the thing. Yes. Which makes sense. 
<laughs> it deals 1d10 damage rather than 1d8, and it no longer has the rarely used undead specific effect. Chill Touch is a necromancy spell as an action. It is touch. You channel the chill of the grave toward one creature. You try to touch. You make a melee spell attack on a hit. It takes 1d10 necrotic, and it can't regain hit points until the end of your next turn. Chill Touch still doesn't deal cold damage. No. Which is fine. The damage is buffed, and now you've got a very beneficial effect on top of it. Yeah, that low, that slight, you know, the again, the the can't regain hit points until the end of your next turn. It's niche. There are several, there are several monsters that just naturally regenerate. Yeah. Uh, and a DM could work in, you know, drinking a health potion, taking a, you know, the enemy spellcaster doing a healing healing uh, spell. So before where it was just like 1d8, it's like, eh. but the 1d, like we are saying with the, with the acid slash. Oh, 1d10. Yes. But you also now have to be at a range of touch. I feel That's like true. they've reoriented what chill touch like who should be taking chill touch mm-hmm. as less of a, a player option. Like being able to stop healing is nice, but it doesn't really come up a lot. There aren't a lot of monsters that heal themselves in their stat blocks. On the other hand, if you have an NPC, if you have an evil spellcaster that's being run by the DM, yeah, what are the players going to do first? Walk up to it. Run right up to this motherfucker and hit him. So now chill touch becomes a really great option for the lich yeah it is now a touch spell and imposing the it deals more damage it's necrotic very thematic for an evil for an evil creature and then also not allowing the players to heal that is a lot more powerful yeah i'm i'm totally on board with the change does it suck that it is now a touch spell as opposed to a range spell yes but also that just makes more sense and yeah. the damage buff will reflect that which i'm totally cool with next we've got friends <laughs> Oh, we have friends? Oh, no. no, no. Oh. The friends cantrips. Anyway. Oh. oh. You, you, there's a reason that you and I started a podcast. Is to <laughs> pretend that we have more friends and have conversation. Anyway, friends. Now forces the target to make a saving throw against the charmed ability. It is an action 10 feet. Concentration up to a minute. Uh, the target must succeed a wisdom saving throw or have the charmed condition for the duration, which is up to one minute. The target succeeds automatically if it isn't a humanoid. If you're fighting it. Or if you've cast the spell on it within the past 24 hours, it ends early if the target takes damage or if you make an attack roll, deal damage, or force anyone to make a saving throw. A slight debuff to the friend's cantrip. It was also a niche cantrip to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to use in the first place. But I also get the... It's a cantrip that if if you get them to... Well, the can... Where's the player's handbook? I don't think we have one up here. God. Damn it. All right. Hold on. I will say uh, I'll, I'll vamp with some Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, they've actually made it very useful, especially when it's like uh, you, when you go to into the rolling screen, it gives you an option. Add friends cantrip. And you're just like, all right, cool. This random guy who I just have to deal with once. Friends. Advantage on my roll. Cool. Bye. You do see eventually like you're, you run away and a minute later you see stop concentrating on friends. That person didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I don't care. So... Previously, friends just gave you advantage on charisma checks, Mm. and then they would be upset. Whereas now, it gives the charmed condition, which then gives you advantage on charisma checks. Gives you advantage on charisma checks. But it also removed the, they're definitely upset with you thing. Yeah. So I think, in a way, it's a bit of a debuff to the, it's kind of, well, would it even really be a debuff? It's kind of just a lateral move to different wording for getting the same effects but now it also it removed the they're definitely pissed at you thing Mm -hmm. afterwards but in as as kind of a balance to that it they can now more easily break that charmed condition yeah so a lateral move to different and probably a bit more reasonable and like we were saying friends is already not a hugely a widely loved cantrip by any means i don't think anybody will uh, complain all that much i agree Poison Spray now has a range of 30 feet rather than 10, uses an attack roll rather than a saving throw, and is now a necromancy spell rather than a concentration spell. 30 foot range action, cause a toxic mist, range spell attack against a target on a hit. It takes 1d12 poison damage. Single target spell, 1d12 poison, highly resisted. Yes. Uh, I think the most commonly resisted next to fire. Yes. Yes. Uh, But it does have a range of 30 feet. For 1d12 poison so a little bit better 
A little bit. A little bit. It seemed. It was it already one d twelve. I guess. I don't think. <sighs> that doesn't sound right, though. Are we just that dumb? dumb? 1d12 poison, yeah, range of 10. I guess that was the thing. Nobody ever took it because it only had a range of 10 feet, so right. it was basically a touch spell. <laughs> eh. Yeah, whatever. Uh, poison spray, fine. Produce flame. Now a bonus action, but the attack portion is still an action. The range of the light has increased to 20 feet, and the range of the attack has increased to 60 feet. Also, the attack can now target creatures or objects. Produce flame as a bonus action, range of self, duration 10 minutes. Flickering flame appears in your hand, remains there for the duration. While there, the flame emits no heat, blah, 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 20 range. Uh, the spell ends if you dismiss it as a bonus action or if you cast it again. Until the spell ends, spell ends you can take a magic action to hurl fire at a target creature or object within 60 feet. You make a ranged attack roll on a hit. It takes 1d8 fire damage. So technically, technically, it's also only available to the druid natively. It natively. It now takes a bonus action to summon it. And then an action to throw it, mm -hmm. which kind of sucks. It's not really going to be meant as an attacking cantrip, most likely. No, but still be able to produce some some light as yeah. a bonus action. And then have something to do with that if like, you are, you're holding this pr produced flame in your hand as a way to light the way. And then you get into combat, you can quickly throw it. Ah, ah. Yeah. Here, take this. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. Uh, probably not going to be using it to attack anyway, which is fine. Like Shalala. Now improves at higher levels, and it gives you the option of dealing force damage or the weapon's normal type. Shalala, the druid cantrip, is a bonus action with a range of touch. Lasts for a minute. A club or quarterstaff you're holding is imbued with nature's power for the duration. You can use your spell casting ability instead of strength for attack and damage rolls of melee attacks using the weapon. So you can't throw it. And the weapon's damage die becomes a d8 as opposed to whatever it normally would be. If the attack deals damage, it can be force damage or the weapon's normal damage type, your choice. The spell ends early if you cast it again or if you let it go. It also deals a d10 of damage at level 5, a d12 at level 11, and 2d6 at level 17. Mm -hmm. So not as much of a damage increase as the normal 1d whatever, 2d whatever, 3d whatever. Right. But that helps. I think it is one of those where... I don't know. Plenty of people I've known have, have taken Shalala, uh, even with its very limited um dam you know, with the, the with the lack of damage increase as you level up. Um but now I think if you were to take the what was it, the barbarian class, the brawler barbarian? Yes, 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 yes. You know, you wanna dip a little you know, you, you get into up into those upper levels, you dip one level into uh into druid. Maybe, all right. Maybe you take like a magic initiate feat. Something like that. You take this. All right. Now you don't have to necessarily rage to do some extra damage with uh, these improvised weapons you're picking up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's totally fine. Uh, shocking Grasp. This one is this one's a little bit interesting. Uh, kind of getting a bit of a debuff, actually. Now shuts down opportunity attacks rather than all reactions. Shutting down all reactions is too powerful for a cantrip. This cantrip has always been meant to provide a partial disengage, which it still does in this version. Like other lightning spells, the damage also no longer makes distinctions about whether the target is wearing metal. Shocking grasp, action, touch, lightning. Make a melee spell attack against the target on a hit, takes 1d8 lightning, and it can't make opportunity attacks until the start of the next turn. Increases to 2d8, 3d8, 48 at 5, 11, at 17. 11. It's interesting that they felt the need to change it from all reactions to just opportunity attacks. I totally understand the design philosophy of a, it's like a somewhat of a disengage, but I feel like the touch limitation of Shocking Grasp makes that okay to begin with. But I mean, if we want to talk about it in the sense of we were, how we were talking about Chilling Touch earlier, mm. where it's like, this thing has run up to me, I touch it, now I can run away. Yes. It's not necessarily supposed to be, I run up, touch it, and now you can't cast shield. Well, also, when you think about it, it's, in again, let's bring up the Eldritch Knight Fighter. Mm -hmm. Runs up to the Lich. It now, he uses Shock and Grasp on the Lich instead of attacking it. Or replaces one of the attacks with Shock and Grasp, which you can now do. Mm -hmm. um, that Lich now can't counterspell. 
I think is kind of the point where it's yeah, like you exactly. can't do the more powerful things. I think that was kind of the main appeal of Shocking Grass because it did require you to be up close and personal. So it's not like your wizard is going to easily be able to shut down another spellcaster's ability to counterspell or shield or whatever. But again, that's not supposed to. That's there, not the that intention. A lot of, a lot of these, yes. uh, a lot of changes throughout these playtests have been to solidify what the intention was of the original thing. Um, and I agree, it's a cantrip. Yeah. If it were, if it were a level one spell, even I would say, yeah, you should, all reaction, all reactions. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would be totally. Yeah. That. It's it's a fair change, but it is a debuff. That being said, if you're a dungeon master, that could be. If somebody really likes shock and grasp, you could reward them. You could. With something special. You could. This is true. This is true. Maybe like gauntlets that amplify it and then it just disables all reaction. Maybe mm-hmm. it increases it to a D8 or D10. Yeah. Size. That'd be fun. That'd be cool. That'd be a fun little idea. Take that for free. You're welcome. Spare the Dying is now a ranged rather than a touch spell. The range increases as you level up and the spell is now also on the druid list. Spare the Dying, Necromancy Cantrip, available to clerics and druids, takes an action, range of 15 feet. Choose a creature within range that has zero hit points, yet is alive. Creature becomes stable. The spell's range doubles when you reach level 5 to 30, 11 to 60, and 17 to 120. It's interesting. I feel like people were already treating Spare the Dying as a range spell a lot of the time. Uh, uh, The Grave Cleric has it. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay, well, the Grave Cleric is going to need to be a little reworked. Yeah, do that, Watsy. Yeah. Grave Cleric is great. Uh, it, grave it, it's not a it was never a loved um cantrip in the yeah. first place it's fine it still sucks as an action mm-hmm. but i get it if you're out of if you're out of healing spell slots you need a second all right well and i guess the uh cleric in general has a lot of bonus actions yeah that is true the cleric it probably is one of the most overloaded with bonus actions classes that there is yeah I would argue the ranger is kind of in that realm as well. Ranger and paladin. Ranger and paladin, but their things usually relate to the... What they're doing. Their, their action. action. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. The last cantrip on this list, the oft-reviled true strike, mm-hmm. is now an attack with a weapon that uses your spellcasting ability rather than strength or dexterity. Divination cantrip as an action for bards, sorcerers, warlocks, and wizards. Guided by a flash of magical insight, you make one attack with the weapon and used in the spell's casting. The attack uses your spell casting ability for the attack and damage rolls instead of using strength or dexterity. If the attack deals damage, it can be radiant damage or the weapon's normal damage type. Also, whether you choose to deal radiant damage or the weapon's normal damage type, the attack deals extra radiant damage when you reach levels 5, where it deals an extra 1d6, 11, 2d6, 17, 3d6. So you are no longer getting advantage with the attack. Is that right? Yeah, so it used to be you would get advantage on the... The yeah. next attack roll you make before the end of your next turn, you have advantage on. Yeah. Uh, true strike is now a useful thing to use. Yes. Uh, the... Man, not being able to, in, to get advantage on the attack, though. I would have rather it giving you advantage on the attack then swap strength or dex for your spellcasting ability personally i actually i'm i'm happy i'm happy to go the other way i'm happy to go with this because there's plenty of other ways to get advantage whether it's the flanking whether it's the blinded condition mm-hmm. whatever um but i think what this conveniently does is if you are starting at level one you're now able to start building towards the uh like the swords bard or the blade singer wizard at your earlier levels mm-hmm. where you normally have to wait it's like okay i've been a bard that's been casting spells from back here so i don't get her okay now i'm the swords bard now i can get into it you can start building that at least thematically more where i don't have to put stuff into decks yeah i can just charisma bot. i think you were getting that already with the change of including the weapon attack in the casting of the spell the well point. that's what i'm saying yeah. as previously true strike was you use your action to give yourself advantage on the next turn. Well, why didn't I just attack this turn and attack next turn? Well, I would rather... That's the same amount of attacks. I would rather, instead of getting the... What I, what I was saying was, instead of the str- in replacing strength or dexterity with your spellcasting ability, and remove that line entirely, and then you get the weapon attack and you get advantage. I would I would rather that. I would rather have a... a you know, I assume my base casting stat is going to be plus four. 
and maybe my dexterity is plus two. I'd rather I'll, I'd rather have the plus four and figure out some other way to have advantage mm-hmm. than to roll twice and get low rolls, get you know just low enough rolls both now, times. I will I will say because I've we've I've talked about this in our in the YouTube video where I'm talking about uh, sharpshooter and great weapon master where advantage averages out to like a plus four mm. bonus to whatever you're doing and so, disadvantage being a minus four. So fighters over there all run here, cast this. Now I have a plus four and advantage. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, and I'll shock and grasp and run away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, regardless, infinitely more useful mm-hmm. than what you would have previously. I am so excited to build the Hexblade Warlock now. I am mm-hmm. so excited to build an Eldritch Knight now, a Bladesinger Wizard. Because just grab it. Like, Bladesinger Wizard. They get what? Three cantrips? Four? Sure. Three. Uh, wizard gets three cantrips, right? I don't remember. I think four. Four. Level one. Level one. You now have True Strike. Mm-hmm. You've got Blade Ward. You can pick up, like, Green Flame Blade or Booming Blade. Those are both good ones, yeah. And then you get your ranged option with, like, Fire Bolt. Or you can replace Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade with True Strike and then get, like, Prestidigitation or whatever. Love other... a, I love Prestidigitation. But now, at level one, you have this suite of cantrips where you have your ranged option, you have your melee option, you have a defensive option. So you always have something that you can do and something that will scale as you level mm-hmm. and something that will benefit you a lot down the line. I do love that True Strike gives you damage buffs when you get at higher levels. For That is pretty it. good. Especially, especially for your Hexblade Warlock or your your packed blade warlock which you can now replace one of the attacks with a cantrip eldritch knight where you can replace attack with a cantrip like all of those features that let you do that Mm -hmm. in addition just getting extra damage getting so much benefit so much benefit that's oftentimes what they lack a little bit is like haha you know the monk i can hit 17 times with and then and and you know each time you have a chance to be stunned the wizard i can do a ton of damage from really far away the knight whack Whack. Okay. But Shield. now, whack. <laughs> boom. Boom. Big boom. Big, big boom. Repeatable every turn without really expending a resource. Big boom. Oh, that's also a big part of it. That, yeah. is, that is the thing. So, cantrips, I like where they're at right you now. Trip right over them. Trip right over those tr- those can. Can absolutely trip right we're, over We're there. head over heels. Head. Which head is over. the normal orientation of a human being. Ass over tea kettle. Don't know why you got a tea kettle. Don't know why your ass is over it. Are you shitting in the tea? Don't shit in the tea. Never, ever shit in the tea. Anyway, <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say about cantrips? I think I think I don't. I have no way to follow up. Don't shit in the tea. <laughs> don't shit in the tea. All right, that is that is it for the news of the week. A pretty light news week. The, I'm glad that we had the Bastions thing. So we really would not have had much, if anything, to talk about without the Bastions release. Well, Sam is going to take a moment to look at the TikTok live chat. We record the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast every other week live on TikTok. You can get the podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, our YouTube channel, as well as YouTube Music. You can follow our TikTok where we have well over 40,000 followers. We need, I need to post videos. We need to make videos. We need to make videos and post them. It's a whole thing. TikTok Really not not in a good spot right now. No. As a platform. No. We're still get followers. We're still get comments. And and thank the Lord for the on this day feature, which is keeping us even kind of relevant. Just, just afloat. Yeah, just keeping us alive. We also have the Instagram, the Twitter, which we don't really use, Discord, Amazon Store, Merch Store, Monday Night Magic live streams every week on TikTok. That's the main thing that we do on TikTok right now. Get our Moxfield deck lists there. Samuel, what do we got from the TikTok live? All right. Um... Uh, Amber Grace asks, do you play Yu-Gi-Oh? We made a Yu-Gi-Oh reference. We do not. No. Played it as a little kid. Probably broke a lot of the rules. Also, I mean, there were a lot less rules to break like back then. That is so. true. And there were a lot of cards that weren't banned. Like, I had, when I was a little kid, I did, like, a Lord, what was it, Lord of D mm, dragon Lord deck D, with, yeah. like, the with like the dragon horn thing that just let me pull dragons out. Yeah. I was a big fan of that. That's cool. Uh, Kelsey Turgo asks, thoughts on the... On Banning Soul Ring. Which guy? What what side would you guys be on? 
I understand the argument that people make when it comes to like banding certain commander staples. And the argument is when you're building a commander deck, there's going to be like five to 10% of the deck, which is always going to be the same mm -hmm. for 95, 99% of decks. Mm -hmm. Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Command Tower, Exotic Orchard, those yeah. things that are going to work in like every single deck. Obviously, monocolor decks aren't really going to need Command Tower or Exotic, sure. that kind of stuff, but. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. like, you're building a hundred card deck. A lot of people are going to struggle to come up with a hundred cards that work synergistically in their deck. Yeah. So it's e I, I'm totally okay with there being the five to ten staples that are cheap. Yeah, that's the big part. Uh, I don't and, and like every commander product has a soul ring in it. It's a cheap card to get. The the only other argument I've ever heard is the about the fast mana how you know commander you know all 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 formats including commander are rapidly power creeping and certain things just people are even arguing that the the good swords of this and that are no longer viable which we we've seen plenty of game, there's plenty of gameplay online you can watch where it's like oh man that sword just turned the entire game around um, but especially in commander there's I see nothing wrong with fast mana as long as everybody at the table has fast mana. Mm -hmm. When one person has a bunch of tapped lands and basics, that then it becomes a bit of a problem because they're not having a good time compared yeah. to everyone else. And the same with the guy who turn one jeweled lotus, turn one mana crypt, turn one soul ring, turn one arcane signet. All right, you have a lot of mana, and no one can add, at this point, even if you have a mediocre to bad deck, you're probably going to have at least you're probably going to be able to take out at least one player within the next couple turns and that's so much mana but at, and at the same time i think we're that's also talking about two different levels of commander like the command the commander deck that's running soul ring arcane signet mana crypt jeweled load all even if they're proxies that's a different player than someone that's buying a precon and upgrading it or brewing their own first deck like well, we can look, get into look that. at our look at our decks uh, our, de our decks right don't. There. Our decks don't have jeweled lotus or mana crypt. You have a jeweled lotus right there. I have a jeweled lotus on the wall because I cracked it from a pack, and I'm like, huh, that's a really expensive, valuable card that I don't want to put in any of my decks. It also doesn't really fit in my decks because it's three mana of one color, mm -hmm. which like my my favorite deck right now, Narset Enlightened Exile, is one blue red white. Jeweled Lotus, one of the one of those mana is just always going to be wasted. Yeah, it's not that useful to me. And it's also, I think we could also go from there onto a different discussion of like people not communicating well about what levels their decks are at. Because the entire power level conversation of decks is so arbitrary and useless, is the thing. But at the same time, if you're like, well. People uh, assigning a number value. Assigning a number, yes. But if yeah. we're talking about like, hey, I have, you know, I have these, these, all these cards that I can get out for free on turn one and ramp out my commander on turn one versus the guy who were saying, I got a precon and upgrade it. Well, those probably aren't on the same level. Yeah, well, and that and that is just a, that is all of these problems. People's problem with soul ring, mm -hmm. I feel like, is a symptom of the larger problem of a lack of communication. Honestly, yeah, I feel like most problems that people have with most aspects of their life is a symptom of the fact that people aren't communicating well. Mm -hmm. And that's that's true of gaming and everything else in life. I have that problem at work all the time, and it makes me want to commit moida. <laughs> commit violent moida. Um, hello, call me insane. Hello, insane. I'm Connor. Uh, ooh, uh, we have Brand. We had Brandon Vol in today. Don't know. If ooh, he's still uh, in. Uh, TikTok Live subscriber Brandon Vol, also a moderator of our live chats for Monday Night Magic. Brandon Vol is one of the good ones. Same We're with, a big fan of Brandon. Same with Mystery Sniper. Mystery Sniper, of course. They popped in. Say, have a great day. Wee woo. Thank you. Wee woo. Um, let's see. Nick Bredo asks, if I'm a Goblin Artificer Artillerist, can I ride my turrets? I see no reason. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Have at it. <laughs> Strap a saddle on that bitch. Let's ride. <laughs> that's, that actually sounds really fucking cool. Like, yeah. I don't so you do that with that. a goblin, gnome. You could probably finagle that with, like, a halfling. Dwarf, maybe. Dwarf, I feel like you're pushing your luck a little bit. If you've got a really heavy turret. Absolutely. Oh, my God. I Oh, in my work game, one of, one of our players is a gnome artificer artillerist. Mm. And he has um, uh, Bodhi. Bodhi. Which is which is his turret. I'm like, hey, we might want to strap a saddle on that bitch. You <laughs> ride him. The problem is that the turret has a speed of like 
20 feet. Yeah. So... You, I mean, I guess if you want to, like, make it a tank, basically, where you're like, I'm rolling into the action. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, but also, technically, if you're just sat on it, it shouldn't require an action to dismount it. Right? Five, take a couple feet of movement. Which, at that point, you could chunk, chunk, chunk forward, and then for, like, one random turn, you can have an effective movement for your character of, like, 40 feet. Sure. Or are you using your movement to move? But no, it's two separate moves. That, talk to your DM. <laughs> talk to your DM. But riding that bitch sounds awesome. We said, we're into that. Um, uh, st- the Dungeon Bros stamp of approval. Uh, oh, we need to get one of those. An artillerist? A, a stamp. A Dungeon oh, Bros stamp of approval. We could probably do that. <laughs> Much easier than an artillerist. A seal of approval that we stamp. We stamp. Na- fucking notarize things. <sighs> The du- the Dungeon Bros D and D notary, oh god, uh, Paula says drive by support and love. Hey Paula, it's been a hot thing. Oh Paula, yes, 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 Paula. yes, yes, yes. Um, n- Noby, what's your opinion on go to on, on the golem totems? The golem totems. Not sure. I was hoping I say it and you know, but I don't. The golem totems is that is that a magic thing or is that a D and D? Noby, if you're still in the chat, we're dumb. Let Gole- us know more. Golem totems. That feels like a token or something, or like a, 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 a type. Barbarian subclass? Golem totem. I don't know. Uh, moving on. Wow, hey, MJ. stupid. Oh, NJ, hello. A frequent viewer of the Dungeon Bros uh, Monday Night Magic live streams. Fanatum says, where do you find play groups to play with? The well, internet. It's really, really great for Internet's great. Uh, if you want people to play with magic, go into your local game store. There's a great place to go. They usually have Friday night events, weekend events, particularly pre-re- pre-releases when people like to show up and play. Uh, but they have weekly events as well. With D&D, it's a little bit harder because it's a bit more of a time commitment to play, a bit more of an investment from everyone. But you can find groups online to play, Discord servers. You could join ours. It's not very active. And by very active, I mean active at all. Um yeah. But there's there's tons of resources online. Even you can even go so far as to uh, there's websites where you can pay a dungeon master like forty dollars to run a session for mm-hmm. you and whoever else happens to be there. So you can offload. You can use money to offload the scheduling aspect of it, and you can just pick a time slot that works for you and then play a game with some people. Alternatively, um, and unfortunate, maybe unfortunate, maybe maybe fortunately, maybe you'll find a new passion, but. Uh... A lot of the times, if you want to have a group to play with, you kind of have to be the one in charge of putting it together. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, at least for the initial bout running the game. Yeah, that is true. That uh, is very true. That is pretty much how we got all of our groups. That's how to, and why we point. both got started, honestly. Yeah. It's like, we want to play D&D. Guess I'm doing it. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, let's see. MJ asks, you guys excited for Doctor Who on the 13th? Not so much about the decks themselves not planning to play, buy any decks but the individual cards yeah there are a couple that i want to pick up there's one i want to pick up for cadric i think there's a couple that i want to pick up but i'm afraid that they're going to be the ones that are like really expensive singles guess you'll find out yeah in that case you might have to spend the money fight somebody i mean i'm i'm rather sizable i just have natural strength because i'm big you might have to uh wager your best card against joey wheeler oh not not joey wheeler Bryce Parrish says MTG is probably the most perfect game ever designed uh, Perfect is, an, is not the adjective I would use I would, argue, I would argue it's the greatest card game of all time Greatest Not perfect at all Oh yeah uh, The most perfect game is chess The most fun game is Broadway Puppy Ball what the most dangerous game is man the fuck are you saying uh you're just gonna gl- we're just gonna nick, gloss over this nick bops back in to say also thank you for pronouncing my name correctly um i get it most pronounced a lot i'm glad i could do that for you i totally forget what i said the first time so i'm not going to ruin the special moment that we have had of course uh hello nice to meet you Linz Linz sue mj says it was nice seeing you guys go live again for a bit i gotta bounce though everyone have a great day you know what, MJ? We too have to bounce. That's true. That is true. It's very exciting. Indeed. 
Dunge- the formerly the Dungeon Bros podcast, now Duels and Mana Dorks. We're going to need to commission some art. We are. We're going to need to commission some art for that. And we're gonna. I'm going to need to read. Hopefully, by the time this podcast posts, I renamed the podcast on all the various podcast services. Round, Round the globe. The globe. Which, of course, you can find Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, YouTube Music, all of that sort of thing. You can follow us on TikTok. Or 40,000 of you already do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. All right, we have a new, we have a new thing. Yes. yes. We have a new thing. <laughs> that is all the time that we have for today. And as I always like to say at the end of the game of D&D, um, the pasta's good. Stay away from that carbonara. <laughs>